If you haven't done so yet, please subscribe to the channel. And if you're enjoying these stories, there's a link below to buy me a cup of coffee. This is the Hasidic Story Project with Barack Holman, podcasting from Jerusalem, Israel. This podcast is sponsored by listeners just like you. To become a supporter of this podcast, please go to HasidicStory.com. H-A-S-I-D-I-C Story.com. You'll never know. You'll never know. You'll never know. You'll never know. Shalom Aleichem, my sweetest friends. Another week, and I have a couple more beautiful Hasidic stories for you. But before I begin, I want to dedicate this podcast episode to the continued success of our soldiers in battle wherever they are, Be'ezrat Hashem, Mamish, to be successful, and for Hashem to keep them safe, and to return all the hostages, alive and healthy. And a refuah shlema, a full recovery, to everyone who's been injured or is sick, the comforting of those that lost loved ones, and the continued unity of the Jewish people here in the land of Israel and all around the world. I want to tell you, my sweetest friends, before I begin to tell the stories, that it is a great honor and a schut to be able to record this podcast and share it with so many people. And it's a project that I've been working on for really many years now. And I just have this deep feeling of gratitude right now to all of the listeners and to HaKadosh Baruch Hu for the schut, for the merit of being able to be a storyteller and to share these stories with you. Many years ago, there was a Tamid Chacham, a Torah scholar, whose name was Reb Betzalel. And Betzalel spent most of his day learning and davening. And he was very fortunate. He was one of those rare scholars that was able to be supported by his wife and didn't have to be bothered by making a living. Now, that meant that Betzalel and his wife Sarah were very poor. Because even though Sarah had a small business, it wasn't much of a business. But she would always say to herself, I get to support my husband in learning Torah. And what a beautiful atmosphere he provides for our home. My children constantly hear the words of Torah coming out of my husband's mouth. And there's a beautiful smell in our house. It's the smell of Gan Eden, of the world to come. Because in my husband's merit, I will also have a great place in the world to come. Now, the way that Sarah made a living was she would go around to the local farms and pick up all kinds of things such as eggs, sometimes a chicken, (laughs) goose feathers, sometimes little tchotchkes, things that people would need around the home, leather, rope, needles, whatever she could find. She would take all of this stuff and then start going to the wealthier homes in town and resell the merchandise. These were the homes of the Balabustas. And Balabusta, which is normally considered somebody who was a business person or had some level of wealth, it means Baal Habayit, meaning the person that owned a home. And it was also the women that ran these homes. So Sarah would go around knocking on the doors of the wealthier people in town, offering her eggs, the goose feathers, the needles, and whatever she had. And people would pay her the cost of the merchandise plus another 10 or 20% that she would add on top of it to save them the trouble of having to go around and pick it up themselves. So she had her principal, the core amount of money that she would use to rebuy merchandise, and she would live off the 10 or 20% that she would make from reselling the stuff. And it wasn't very much, and it was okay during most of the year, but when the winter would come, as we see here in Israel, chaval azman, forget about it. There were no farmers selling their eggs, The chickens were in the coops. It was frozen and snowing outside. And she didn't have the freedom to just walk around in the morning and pick up all the merchandise and go house to house and resell. So she would do the best that she could, but it was very, very hard. And she knew that she had to hold on to that core amount of money. Otherwise, she wouldn't be able to rebuy merchandise when the time came. And every now and then she would be fortunate someone would come by the house wanting to sell their own stuff and ask her to go resell it. But winters were very hard. And she had a family to feed. And she had a husband that was sitting and learning Torah all day long. And he also needed to eat. And it got to the point where Sarah knew she had no choice. She had to tap into that core amount of money that she used for her business. And she had told herself, that money is Kodesh. That money is holy. I can't touch it. But there's no holy when your children are starving, chas shalom, God forbid. And so she used the money. I know the feeling. I've done it many times myself. 
And she went and bought food, but eventually that money ran out as well. And now she literally had nothing left. And unfortunately, she had to go to her husband and break the news to him. She says, Betzalel, I really respect you sitting and learning all the time. I think it's a beautiful thing. And you know you have my full support all the time. He looks up at Sarah and he says, no. She said, well, I don't make very much money. And now it's winter. And there isn't much to buy and resell in the winter. And I had my principal and I slowly started spending it. And now we spent everything. We don't have anything left. We barely have any food left in the house. We can't feed the kids. Betzalel, what are we going to do? And Betzalel, he looks up from his Gemara that he was learning from. And he says, Sarah, really? Has God ever abandoned us? She said, no. But right now, we literally have no food and no money. And Betzalel said, fine. Scrape together whatever crumbs you can. Make a little stew for the kids. And give them something to eat. You and I will go without food until Hashem is ready to send us money. And don't worry, everything will be fine. And Sarah says, Betzalel, how can you be so cold? How can you tell a mother and a wife not to worry about her family when I see that my children are freezing and starving, God forbid? It's true, Betzalel, you're a great scholar. and You have your special relationship with Hashem. And I'm just a simple woman. But I don't know what we're going to do. And Betzalel went back to learning. He said, Sarah, everything will be fine. Hashem will take care of us. Everything will be fine. Do what I said. Feed the kids. We'll be okay. And so she did. She mixed a little bit of oats that she had with some water, fed it to the kids, put them in bed, and she and Betzalel did not eat that night. Now in those days, there were no toilets inside the house. There was an outhouse that was used by several people in the community, and it was pretty far away from the house. And even though Sarah went to sleep, Betzalel continued learning, and he might have been a great scholar, but he wasn't an angel, and he needed to go to the bathroom. So, in the middle of the night, he works his way to the public toilet outside. And on the way, in the mud, in the snow, he sees a glimmer of something reflecting off of the moon. He bends down and moves the snow and the mud. He picks it up. And when he gets back home, he washes it. And he sees that it's a silver coin. Silver coin. He said, Baruch Hashem. This coin in Sarah's careful hands will be able to support this family for at least a week, if not longer. And then he sat down and continued learning. But as he was learning, he had a thought. Is this the way that Hashem wants to support a Torah scholar? By giving me a coin in the mud on my way to the toilet in the middle of the night? This is not a respectable way to support this family. And so he says, I'm going to put this money in the tzedakah box in shul. Tomorrow morning, first thing when I get there, I'm giving this coin to tzedakah. And so that he wouldn't forget it, he put the coin on the table, right in front of his talis and tefillin. And he went back to learning, and Sarah heard something in the house. And she was also hungry, and she couldn't sleep at night. So she got up, and she walks to the main room. And on the way, she sees the silver coin shining on the table, next to Betzalel's talis and tefillin. And she says, Betzalel, where did this coin come from? And Betzalel says, Sarah, get it out of your mind. It's not ours. She said, what do you mean it's not ours? It's sitting here right on our table. And there's a starving family that would be very happy to have some money so that we can eat. If it's not ours, what's it doing here? And Betzalel said, well, I found it on the way to the toilet in the mud. And I decided to give it to Tzedakah. So Sarah says to Betzalel, let me understand this. You found a coin. And you found a coin in a public place where halachically you're allowed to take it and keep it because whoever lost it would have given up any hope of finding it and there's no unique identifying characteristics for someone to claim it. And he says, Sarah, you're not such a simple woman after all. You got it exactly. She says, but Salil, how can you do such a thing? Our children are starving and you and I didn't eat anything all day. He looks at her and he says, Sarah, I have self-respect. I'm a Torah scholar, and it's true we haven't eaten, and we have no money in the house, but I will not accept Hashem supporting us in such a disgusting way. If Hashem wants to help us, he'll find a nicer way to do it, a more respectable one. Sarah turned around in disgust and went back to bed, quite upset with her husband, and he tried to put it out of his mind and get back to learning. Now, of course, there was no electricity back then, so he learned by candlelight. And he would put the candle next to the window because there was a little bit of moonlight that would come in from the window 
And with the candle, he was able to learn better. And late that night, two merchants were working their way through this little town, which was completely dark, except for a little light from the moon. And it was very cold and snowing outside. And their horses were tired, and they were tired, and they needed a place to just stop and rest for the night. They needed some shelter from the snowstorm. And what did they see in the distance in this small town? A candle burning in a window. So the Jewish merchants slowly worked their way over to Betzalel's house and knocked on the door. They felt the warm air coming out of the house. And they see a Torah scholar with a long beard in Sitziot. And he says to them, my sweetest friends, please come in. And the two merchants come in the house. And he said to them, you're welcome to stay in my house, but I don't have any food to give you. I'm very sorry, but currently we don't have any food in the house. And the merchant said, food? You need food? We have plenty of food. All we need is a warm house and some hot water for our tea. So Betzalel calls out to Sarah, who heard that something was going on. She gets out of bed. Ah. He says, Sarah, please prepare some water for our guests. And as she's boiling the water, the two merchants went back into the carriage and they took out bags filled with food, bread and butter, herring, onions and garlic, cheese, dried fish, all kinds of delicacies, things that Betzalel and Sarah had not even seen, yet alone eaten for many, many years. Now Betzalel and Sarah weren't going to partake in the food without being invited. And as soon as the two businessmen saw the eyes of Betzalel and Sarah staring at the food, they pushed the food in their direction. They said, please, join us. And Sarah says to Betzalel, can I wake up the kids? And he says, sure. So she goes and brings the kids. And the kids had never seen food like this in their whole life. And the businessmen were very pleased because for them, this was no big deal. This was just the food that they carried on every trip they went on. They had a nice place to stay, warm, hot tea, plenty of food. Now, Betzalel and Sarah were trying to hold back while they were eating to not show how hungry they really were. And as they're eating, the two businessmen and Betzalel start exchanging words of Torah. And the businessmen realize that Betzalel is a great scholar. They were very impressed, not just in his ability to understand the Torah, but in his understanding of general human relations and even business. Because, of course, this is mentioned in the Talmud as well. So after about an hour of conversation, one of the merchants says to the other one, Hey, Shlaimi, maybe instead of going to Lemberg, we should ask Reb Betzalel here. And he says, David, that's a great idea. So Betzalel says, what's going on, my friends? How can I help you? They said, Rabbi, we're very impressed with your knowledge. We are two businessmen that have been working together for many years. And we invested a large sum of money, and we did not get back the amount that we had expected. We have a dispute because it was Shlomi's idea over here to invest the money. And even though I agreed to go along with him, we're looking for a rabbi to judge the dispute between us as to who is supposed to pay back the other and how much and what we're supposed to do in this situation. Now, we were heading to the rabbi of Lemberg, who was known as a great scholar. But rabbi, it's miserable outside. We're already freezing. We're so grateful to be here in this warm home. If you don't mind, Rabbi, maybe in the morning after we got a little bit of rest, you can listen to all the details, and you'll be the judge. You'll give us a din Torah. And Rabbi Tzalel says, yes, of course, I'd be happy to do that for you. And the two merchants said, you should know, Rabbi, we have a rule. Whenever we go to a rabbi to be an arbitrator, we pay 10% of the disputed amount. And this is a very large amount of money, and we have the 10% here for you, Rabbi. We will pay you for it in order to give us a judgment. And we trust that you will make a wise and honest judgment in the case. And then we'll be able to get along and do more business together. Because, of course, the two of us have been friends for so many years. And we wouldn't want this business deal to get between us. So Batala says, yes, of course. You know, it says in the davening, These are the things that a person eats the fruits of in this world, and the reward for them is in the world to come. And the list is, Honoring your mother and father, Acts of kindness, Waking up and davening in the morning, in the evening, specifically going to shul, Having guests, visiting the sick, supporting a bride and groom at their wedding, escorting the dead to their burial, paying attention to your davening and understanding the davening, 
bringing peace between two friends, between husband and wife, the Talmud Torah connected Kunam. And when you add to that learning Torah, it's equal to them all. So he said, it'd be my pleasure. And in the morning, they ate breakfast and went to shul. And as soon as Rebbe Tzalel entered the synagogue, without anyone noticing, he dropped the silver coin into the tzedakah box. And he thanked Hashem with all of his heart for not letting him and Sarah down and providing him with his livelihood in the most honorable and respectable way, just as he had hoped Hashem would do for him and his family. You see, my friends, never limit Hashem. You don't have to be very specific. You don't have to say, Hashem, I need $1 million in my bank account right now. But you can tell Hashem, Hashem, please support me in a respectable way. Bezat Hashem, if you have the emuna, if you have the trust and faith in Hashem, He will provide for you, just like Rebbe Tzalel and Rebbe Tzansara. I have another story for you. This story took place in the 1970s when there was a young man who had grown up in a Torah observant home in New York and curiosity and the Yetzirah, the evil inclination, had brought him to go very far away from his Jewish roots and he became interested in Native American culture. Now it made sense to him because he knew as a Jew he was an indigenous person to the land of Israel. The Native Americans were indigenous to America. So he figured, as an indigenous person, I'll connect with indigenous people. And what do I have to get involved with Judaism and Israel? It's much easier for me here in America to learn about Native American culture. And eventually he made his way to Montana, found a tribe on a tribal reservation which for maybe my Israeli listeners, if they don't know what a tribal reservation is, in 1758, the government of the United States recognized 326 areas in America that they called Native American reservations. And basically, it's in America, but it's run by the people that are the descendants of that tribe. And so this Jew found his way to a tribal reservation and started learning the language and customs and religious practices of the Native American tribe in Montana. And one of the things that really interests him was shamanism, which is a religious practice that tries to cure people with magic or drugs or some type of altered state of consciousness. And he was becoming quite good at being this medicine man. And after a while, he heard that the greatest shaman that was alive at the time who lived in Newfoundland, Canada. So he decided, I've learned all I can from this tribe here in Montana. I'm going to the northeast coast of Canada, and I'm going to find this woman who is the greatest medicine healer of all the Native Americans, and I'm going to learn from her. And he was able to get a meeting with her. And he was very excited. And he said, wow, what a privilege and an honor. I'm going to be able to learn shamanism on the highest level possible. And he waited outside the room and she called him in and he was about to introduce himself. He was going to say that he grew up in a religious Jewish home, but he found the truth in shamanism and he wants to learn from the best of the best. But he didn't get a single word out of his mouth. She looks at him and she says, what are you doing here? You don't belong here. Go back to your people. He was shocked. He said, but you are my people. You are Native Americans. She said, no, you are a Jew. This place is not for you. This is for Native Americans. You have your own indigenous people and your own land. He said, but she didn't even let him get a word out. She said, no buts. Leave and go back to your people. He said, but I've studied so hard and I've learned so much and I lived on a reservation and I learned the language. She said, I'm telling you, you are not one of us, and you never will be. You're a Jew. Go back to your people. And so he had no choice. He left, and he realized that his journey into Native American culture was over. Because if the best of the best had rejected him, he really had no place to go. And he thought, I'm going to go back to New York. 
I'm going to live a Torah observant life again? After all I've learned and my consciousness has been expanded? And he realized that he had no choice. I mean, here was the number one shaman telling him what to do. She said, you're a Jew, go back to your people. So he decided to go back to New York. Now in the 70s, there weren't so many yeshivot or even rabbis that were prepared to deal with somebody like him who had left Judaism and been living as a Native American for so many years. Pretty much everywhere he went, they slammed the door in his face. They weren't interested in a rebel like him. But eventually, somebody tells him to go to Far Rockaway, to the Shar Yeshuv Yeshiva, and to ask Rabbi Shlomo Firefelt. And so when he shows up at the Yeshiva, Rabbi Firefelt sees him, and even though he was still dressed as a Native American, and certainly not looking like a religious Jew, the rabbi didn't show any reaction at all. He said, please come in. And the young man and the rabbi sat together. And the rabbi said, yes, please tell me, what are you doing here? So he said, Rabbi, I grew up in a religious home, but I left. I got into Native American culture. I learned shamanism. I went to the greatest shaman in the world, and she told me to get out of her house. I don't belong there. She said, I'm a Jew and to go back to my people. So I'm looking for a way to get back to my people. So the rabbi said to him, this is very interesting, and I would like very much to speak with you. But since you just showed up at the door, and I have a very tight schedule, would it be possible for you to come next week, and then I can set aside a larger amount of time to speak with you? And they agreed on a certain time, and the young man left, and he was wondering, should he really keep the appointment a week later? On the one hand, he was grateful that the rabbi had taken him in. On the other hand, the yeshiva seemed like a very strange place to him, and the rabbi didn't even really listen to him. On the other hand, the rabbi was different than the other rabbis he had met, especially those in his early days in yeshiva, when he was a younger man. And he was very warm and sincere. And the entire week, he debated with himself whether he's going to show up for the meeting or not. And on the day of the meeting, he showed up. And the rabbi greeted him very warmly. And he said, please tell me again, in more detail, about your life with the Native Americans. Of course, back then they called them Indians. And the rabbi asked many questions as the young man was speaking. And then, after about an hour of the two of them talking, there was a knock at the door. And one of the rabbis asked if Rabbi Freierfeld can come to the Beit Midrash, to the study hall, to answer a complicated question. And the rabbi says to the young man, please stay here, I'll be right back. I'll be gone just a few minutes. Please don't go anywhere. And the rabbi left the room, and the young man gets up from his chair. He starts walking around the rabbi's office. He's looking at the wall-to-wall -wall shelves, and the books crammed into every crevice, and how many books there were, and how well used they were. And then he saw on the floor next to the rabbi's chair, there were two books. And the young man thought this was very strange that the rabbi would put holy books on the floor. You don't put holy books on the floor. And so he bent down to pick them up. And what he saw completely took him by surprise. What he had in his hands were two books from the local public library about Native American culture and life on the reservations. The reason that the rabbi had asked him to come back a week later was so that he could learn more and be able to interact with this young man. When the young man realized the effort that Rabbi Freierfeld had made for him and how much he cared about him, it opened his heart to care about the rabbi and his values. And that day, he enrolled in the Shar Yeshuv Yeshiva, and eventually he moved to the famous Lakewood Yeshiva in New Jersey, and eventually he did what the great shaman had told him. He embraced being a Jew and came back to his people and his roots. And it was that journey that allowed him to be a very special member of that community the father, husband, and grandfather of a very large, kosher, and joyous Jewish family. As I'm sitting here and recording the story, whenever there's a rabbi that I know there's a picture of him, I bring it up on one of my screens on the computer, and I'm looking at a picture of Rabbi Freierfeld, who passed away in 1990, and I can see the kindness in his eyes. All I can say is thank you, Rabbi, for what you did for everyone, this Jew, and all of us.
Thank you so much for listening. As always, my sweetest friends, thank you to all the supporters of the podcast, those that send in contributions, those that leave comments and share the podcast. And I hope, Bezat Hashem, that you'll have a good week and a good Shabbos and a good Chodesh. It's now Chodesh Elul, the month of Elul. I'm still not ready for Purim and for sure not ready for Elul and not ready for Tishrei. But whether we're ready or not, it's coming. And so may Hashem bless us that when the day comes, we are prepared emotionally, physically, and spiritually. Take care of yourselves, my sweetest friends. Zai gesund.